Did you know that in Texas, it is against the law to shoot a buffalo from the second floor of a hotel? And did you know that in Alaska, it is illegal to shove a moose out of an airplane? And did you know that on the streets of Oklahoma, it is illegal to make an ugly face at a dog? Well, just to spite the state of Oklahoma this week, I made an ugly face at my dog. And guess what? <laughs> she didn't care. <laughs> Did you know that we as humans have an amazing capacity to both make laws and then be incredibly legalistic about them? Even God's people have that capacity. For example, by the time of Jesus, did you know that the scribes and Pharisees had tied up so many rules and regulations around their people that it was sometimes hard to live? I mean, Sabbath was a perfect example. Sabbath was supposed to be God's day and his gift to us of rest. And yet, they put so many burdens on people that sometimes people wished it was any day but the Sabbath. There were all kinds of rules. You probably know some of them. For example, you couldn't buy on the Sabbath. You couldn't sell on the Sabbath. You couldn't wash on the Sabbath. You couldn't wash your pots. You couldn't wash uh, the floor. In fact, you dare not take a bath on the Sabbath, which was allowed, because you might spill a little soapy water out of the bathtub and you would be guilty of washing the floor. Do you know that there were laws against how much you could and couldn't carry? Therefore, women, it wouldn't be wise to wear a little bow on your dress because if you stood up and walked across the room, you would be guilty of carrying that bow. And you couldn't move a chair on the Sabbath. First of all, it was by far too heavy to be allowed to be picked up. But if you dragged the chair, remember most people in those days had dirt floors, if you dragged the chair across the floor, it may make little ruts in the dirt, which would be a lot like plowing, which was forbidden, and therefore you were working. <laughs> yes. We humans have an amazing capacity to make laws and be legalistic. And would it surprise you that on our journey here through Matthew, as we are in Matthew chapter 12, that it starts with legalism on the Sabbath? Listen to these words, verse 12. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they came up to them and said, Unlawful! Unlawful! You're not allowed to do that on the Sabbath. That's my translation, but, but that's what they were saying. And so, as we've walked through the Gospel of Matthew, up through the end of chapter 11, what we have seen particularly from the scribes and Pharisees and, and those who were legalistic, was first indifference to Jesus. Eh, just a guy over there. And then, as people started seeing something in him, next it was doubt. Soon, it was criticism. Indifference, doubt, criticism. Now in chapter 12, everything begins to turn. Today we are going to see a new pattern. First there was rejection, then there was destruction, and finally there was blasphemy. Now the pattern kind of went like this. The, Jesus rejected their view of the Sabbath, so they rejected Jesus. But Jesus then upped the ante. You know what he said in verse 8? You can read it here. He said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. <laughs> Remember our pattern? 
He rejected their view of Sabbath, and so they rejected him. They viewed him now as committing blasphemy. Not only was he saying he was Lord of the Sabbath, he was basically saying he was Lord. They viewed him as committing blasphemy, and so by the end of this chapter, they are going to be guilty of blasphemy. So let's read what comes next, verse 9. It says, Jesus left that place and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they, the scribes and the Pharisees, they asked him, so as to accuse him, is it lawful to cure on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, And he he answered them with a question, as he always did, instead of just a straight-out answer. He says, so let me ask you a question. Suppose one of you has only one sheep, and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath. Will you not lay hold of it and lift it out? Well, how much more valuable is a human being than a sheep. So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Sir, stretch out your withered hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored, as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Now you remember our pattern, right? It was rejection and then destruction and then blasphemy. (laughs) And here we are at that destruction point of this time. So remember our pattern. Jesus rejected their view of the Sabbath, so they rejected Jesus. Now here is Jesus, and what is he doing? He is showing the power of heaven. He is curing the sick, right? And what are they showing in response? They are showing their power on earth. They have a power to persecute him. They have the power to arrest him. They have a power even maybe to work toward his death. All right? Jesus is showing the power of heaven. They're showing the power of earth, but it's worse than that. While Jesus is showing the power of heaven, what are they doing? They are showing the power of hell. Now, you remember the passage in John chapter 10 where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep, but the thief has only come to steal and kill and destroy. What does it say that they are doing? The Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Jesus is revealing the power of heaven. They are revealing the power of hell. So that's number two. Now, there's another passage here that we need to use to set up a little bit of context. Starts at verse 15. When Jesus became aware of, essentially, their conspiracy to kill him, he departed. And many crowds followed him, and he cured all of them. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant, whom I have chosen. I will put my spirit upon him. Now, it is impossible to understand the life and ministry of Jesus Christ unless you understand the power of the Spirit. So remember, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was baptized by the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. He was enlightened by the Spirit. He was anointed by the Spirit. It says in the Scripture, he rejoiced in the Spirit. He spoke through the Spirit. He was full of the Spirit, on and on and on. The Spirit was central to the life of Jesus Christ, which leads to an aside. If, if the Spirit was important to Jesus, do you think the Spirit ought to be important to us? Well, Spirit, keep that word in mind because it comes up in the next story. So it says, they brought to him a demoniac, someone possessed by demons, And 
Jesus cured him. And all the crowds were amazed. But the Pharisees said, oh, it is only by Beelzebul, the chief of the demons, that he does this. <laughs> by Beelzebul? Is that where the power comes in? And here is the beginning of the blasphemy. Verse 28, Jesus says, since he asks them a question, he says, so what if, instead of by that power of Beelzebub, what if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons? Then the kingdom of God has actually come to you. If I'm doing this by the Spirit, then the kingdom is right here. He's saying essentially, now, now guys, you can doubt me. I mean, I know I look like a human. I'm, I'm fully human, but I'm fully God. But he's saying, you can doubt me. I look like a human. But do not doubt the Spirit of God. Therefore, I tell you, people will be forgiven for every sin except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That will not be forgiven. Anybody here ever hear of the unforgivable sin? This is it. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. He says every other sin can be forgiven. So let's follow our pattern that we've started here at the beginning of the gospel. First, they were indifference. Can indifference toward Jesus and the kingdom be forgiven? Yeah. Uh, how about doubt? How many people do you know, maybe it was you that had a season of doubt? Can that be forgiven? Of course it can. How about criticism? People criticizing the church, can that be forgiven? Sure. We turn to today. Now we have this pattern of rejection, destruction, and then blasphemy. Can rejection be forgiven? Yeah. Look at the Apostle Paul, for example. How did he start his journey? He was a good Pharisee. He began to persecute the church. He was rejecting the things of God and, after Pentecost, the work of the Holy Spirit. So, can rejection be forgiven? Of course it is. Paul's the good example. Now, how about this one? Destruction. Can destruction and murder be forgiven? What did Paul do? Paul was there as part of the first killing of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. Can even murder be forgiven? Yes. Yes. How many people have done bad things in their life and repented and God has welcomed them into the kingdom? Now, we shouldn't use that as a license to sin. What does it say in the writings of Scripture? It says... Should we sin all the more so that grace may be abound? <laughs> By no means. The Apostle Paul says, do not be deceived. God must not be mocked. We can't mock God by using his grace as license to sin. You know that, right? Okay? But there is one step beyond even murder. And that's blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Now, I have to confess, I was confused about that for much of my life and even much of my ministry. What is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Okay. Now, is my <laughs> confusion forgivable? Of course it is. Is, yours unfor is your confusion, your doubt, your worries, your... It's all forgivable, right? Except for this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So what is it? Well, we need to look in context here. And context makes it clear what this is. First of all, throughout Jesus' ministry, God, particularly in the person of the Son, Jesus Christ, has shown up. And the Holy Spirit has consistently shown up. That power of God on earth. Even in this chapter, man with a withered hand, healed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Demons cast out, by the power of the Holy Spirit. All the way through the gospel, Jesus preached 
in the power of the Holy Spirit. He taught in the power of the Holy Spirit. He fed the 5,000 and walked on water in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because of the power of the Holy Spirit, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the blind see, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news preached to them by the power of the Holy Spirit. And these people, these scribes and Pharisees, they have seen the power of the Holy Spirit. They have seen it. And they have rejected God and the power of God through the Holy Spirit. So what is the unforgivable sin? It is seeing every evidence of heaven. And no one saw more than they did in those days because Jesus himself was here. It is seeing every evidence of heaven and attributing it to hell. This man casts out demons by the power of Beelzebul. Do you know what the unforgivable sin is? It is calling the power of the Holy Spirit the work of the devil. That is what finally crosses over that line. It is being given every, 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 every evidence of the power of God through the Holy Spirit and calling it the work of the devil. That is the unforgivable sin. So let's jump just a little bit further because we're in the season of Easter. We've got to do this here in chapter 12. Uh, verse 38, it says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given except... Now wait a minute, we've got to stop there for a minute. How many signs has Jesus given them all the way along the way? He teaches with power. He preaches with power. I mean, he fulfilled like Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor and proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. Jesus has shown them every sign, and yet they're saying, no, we're not going to count any of those. We want a sign. Now, what is the sign that they want? Well, there's a passage. This is in chapter 12, in 16, where Jesus uses almost some of the exact same words. So 16 is going to give us a little context. So 16.1, it says, the Pharisees and Sadducees came and to test Jesus, they asked him to show a sign, and here's the difference, from heaven. Okay, here's what they were saying. They were saying, well, that other stuff doesn't matter. But if you can just do this and rearrange the constellations, then maybe we'll believe you. That's what they wanted, a sign from heaven. And so Jesus says to them, exact same words as in 12, an evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except, and here's the key part, the sign of Jonah. Anybody here kind of know what the sign of Jonah is? <laughs> well, let me give you uh, an introduction to a little bit of prophecy that we don't always think about. We know what most prophecies are. People like Isaiah speak and they write down their words and we watch them be fulfilled later in history. Well, there's another type of prophecy. It's called type prophecy. There are many things and people and events in the Old Testament which are types of what is going to be fulfilled, for example, by Jesus in the future. So let me give you just a few examples. Uh, you heard in the writings of Paul about the old Adam who brought sin into the world. But Jesus is the new Adam who brings forgiveness and salvation into the world. Okay, remember that one, right? Uh, how about this one, the Passover? There was the old blood of the lamb that covered God's people and kept them from death. Well, what about Jesus, the new Passover lamb? 
His blood on the cross covers us and saves us from death. What about the manna? You know what manna is in the journey through the wilderness? The old manna was, well, it was not only daily bread, but it was supernatural bread. It was a connection with God. Well, the new manna is Jesus. He is the bread of life. Bread supernatural for our journey. These are all types. Do you see that? Well, Jonah, Jesus is saying here, was a type. All right? First of all, he was a prophet who came from afar to proclaim a message of repentance. Do you think Jesus was a prophet, and more than a prophet to be sure, but at least a prophet who had come from afar all the way from heaven to give us a message of repentance? Jonah is a type, but that's not the type that Jesus is going to talk about here. There is an important image. And so, if we turn back to chapter 12, it says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to Jesus, Teacher, sow us a sign from you. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except, you know it now, the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so for three days and three nights the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. Now, first we've got to stop and go, how many of you ever thought, was he really swallowed by a whale? <laughs> you ever thought that? A lot of people, some of these stories are what stop people in their tracks. And, and here's the message. We talked about it all last week. It is so many people are so focused on the natural that they can't go to the supernatural. But remember, God, the creator of heaven and earth, made all of the natural. So what's the big deal about making a big fish? right? That's where we have to go. It's like any, any ideology that says God is smaller than he is, is a deceitful ideology. But here is God, power in heaven. And the point is not, did he really get swallowed by a fish? Jesus has a point here. He says, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, guess what's going to happen to me on the third day? Do you know what the sign of Jonah was? It was Easter. Power of the resurrection. I've told people before, you know what? We're Easter people. People sometimes laugh at that, but it's true. We are people of the resurrection. The supernatural power of God to raise us from the dead. We are Easter people. And the sign of Jonah, the only sign that the world is going to get is that resurrection. He's not going to rearrange the constellations. People already ignored all the other miracles. That is the one. If anyone comes talking to you about what is this gospel, it's very simple. Jesus came because he loved us. He died to save us from our sins. And he rose to open the gates to eternal life. That's it. That's the gospel. That is the message that we have to proclaim. And proclaiming is an important point of where we are right now. Here we are, end of this part of the sermon. There's just a quick end. Every week at the end of the sermons, I've been trying to point us to say, how does what we've just learned apply to our lives right now in this shutdown world? And so, as everything was ramping up and up and up, including fear and anxiety, what my messages were were intentionally messages of hope. Now, as things begin to head back down, and, and soon they're going to be opening things up again, the message is now proclaiming. How do we speak to a broken world about the goodness of God? Do you know our world is hungry right now? I, I read something just recently. I put it in a devotion that 
21.5% of non-Christians have actually picked up their Bible. Do you know why they picked it up? There's three reasons. Number one is they know that there's something not quite right within them. This has revealed a lot of things, and i got to make things right. Second reason, they have realized that something is not quite right with us as a nation, as a world, as a culture. And they want to find an answer that's better than what we've had. Those are the first two reasons. There's a third one. The third reason is this. They are wondering if, they, if these are signs of the end of time. They are seeing something. They want to know. They want to be ready. That's actually a good thing. One of our members said that a neighbor rushed over to their house one day, pounded on the door. When they opened it, I mean, they knew our members were Christians. They pounded on the door. When our members opened it, they said, are these signs of the end? I mean, they had seen all these things this year. The locusts all over Africa. They had seen famines and earthquakes. They have seen now pestilence. Is this a sign of the end? Now, I can tell you kind of a secret is that some people, some, some very trusted people, are beginning to say, you know, we're kind of seeing some end time signs right now. For example, you've heard of the mark of the beast, right? Mark of the beast, 666, either put on the forehead, put on the hand. Uh, when the Antichrist comes, new world order, what's going to happen is that in order to do uh, transactions, monetary, financial transactions, you have to have a mark. Well, <laughs> did you know that one of the four or five richest people in the world right now has been working on developing a technology to chip everyone in the world in order that they may do now cryptocurrency financial transactions. But it's more than that. It's interesting that this, this rich person is advocating because, oh my goodness, this COVID-19, we're going to need a vaccine. Everyone in the world is going to need to be vaccinated. So, the, what we're going to do is when you're vaccinated, your proof of being vaccinated is this chip. And unless you're vaccinated and have this chip, you cannot do financial transactions. Is that beginning to sound like the end times? Now, now there's one more piece to this. Did you know this chip has a patent number? And did you know that the patent number was... W O twenty twenty zero six zero six zero six. How many of you just heard Twilight Zone music? Do 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 do. Now, the point here is not that we are hearing Twilight Zone music. The point is always some of Jesus' last words right before the Last Supper and all the events unfolded in uh, that day of crucifixion, his last teachings, Matthew 24 and 25, we went through all of this last week, was be ready, be ready, be ready. When people come to us, I don't want you to go, do, 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 do. Let me tell you something crazy. Do, 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 do. No. What I want you to do is to preach hit by a bus theology, Right? Hit by a bus. Tomorrow, when we're out driving, we could be hit by a bus and we'd immediately meet Christ. Right? Tomorrow, we could be hit by a virus and we could meet Christ. Tomorrow, we could be hit by a heart attack and we could meet Christ. That's what we tell people. If it's made you pay more attention, then you need to be paying attention. All right? Our call is to go and tell people. But here's my, what I might rather focus on. So first of all, people are going to come to you, they're going to ask you, how did you weather this? Remember what your answer is supposed to be? 
because of Jesus, I weathered it so much better than I would have otherwise. Because of Jesus. Right? And here is maybe what we can perhaps more realistically pray for. And that is not necessarily the return, but it could happen. But revival. I was listening to a pastor saying, I have prayed for revival for 35 years. I've tried to imagine everything that it would look like. And he said, it's beginning to happen, but it looks nothing like I ever envisioned. Because never in my wildest imaginings did I suppose that it could happen invisibly, in millions of homes, underground, quietly, and without huge opposition. He says, more and more people are turning to Scripture. He says, more and more churches are seeing increased hits on their websites as people are tuning in to worship. He says, signs are there to indicate a hope. He says, for example, many Americans' favorite gods have been toppled. Sports is now gone from kids' soccer to Major League Baseball. Concerts and celebrity worship is out on the edge too. Commercialism may not be dead, but it's hurting badly. Most partying is gone. He says, sometimes when we won't give up our own idolatries, the true God will take action to show how false these gods really are. People are going to be hungry. How did you weather this? Very simple. It was because of Jesus that I survived as well as I did. And when they want what you want, tell them the simple message that Jesus came because he loved us. He died to forgive us our sins. And he rose to give us the path to new life. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.